So moving ahead with 21, this one is, is pretty intense. So here we're looking at the clausius clapeyron equation. Uh, so we're looking at kind of a comparison of two vapor pressures is equal to the negative enthalpy of vaporization. In this case, that's going to be sublimation. We're going directly from a solid to a gas over the ideal gas constant times one over temperature minus one over temperature. I'm not sure if I flip those around or not, but anyway, the end result is, is that it turns out we can, in the lab, measure various vapor pressures, measure at various temperatures, and then construct a plot of natural log of vapor pressure versus one over temperature, and the slope of that line should be equal to the enthalpy of vaporization, in this case sublimation, over the ideal gas constant. So when they give us a y equals mx plus b, all we have to do is multiply that by negative r, and that will give us our answer. Um, However, it says in here that the vapor pressure is in bar, and the ideal gas constant, 8.3 on four, is what I used, which is in kilopascals, not bars. So I don't know how that translation works out in terms of the natural log. So I ended up getting the answer C, and I just moved on with my life. Um, and that ended up being marked correct. So I'm not exactly sure if that's a mistake or if somehow that cancels out in that process, but marked right, so I didn't worry about it too much. Uh, 22 is just a qualitative entropy calc or question. Uh, so usually on this level of test for entropy, you're looking for bigger molecules with more things in them are gonna have greater entropies because they have more means to store energy. In this one, we're looking at water, water, and water, solid liquid gas. Well, obviously the gas has more entropy than the solid or the liquid. So, so we're really gonna compare C and D and C and D are pretty easy to compare as well because we're looking at one mole of steam versus one mole of hydrogen gas and a half a mole of oxygen gas. And this is 1.5 moles total of gas. And so therefore, D is the simple answer here. Like we're looking at a greater amount of moles of gas and, and that was probably a little easier than it needed to be. So. So on to 23, 23 is a problem that really is long, and if, you're, if you get to this one and you're, and you're not very quick at these, you might want to skip this and come back later. You'll know how to do it, but it'll take a long time. So we're looking at a, what the, we're missing one value here, and we're gonna to have to figure out the sum of these to figure out the sum of these, and then go backwards to figure out this final one. Uh, so first of all, we need our reaction. We're looking for the Gibbs free energy of formation of methane. So we need a reaction that involves all four of the chemicals here. So that's going to be the methane gas reacting with uh, steam. And then that's going to turn into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So an oxidation reduction where this is getting oxidized, this is getting reduced. Um, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, beyond that, what we now need to do is we need to figure out what the total entropy of reaction is, the entropy of reaction. Then use delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S, find the total of the Gibbs free energy, and then work backwards to find that missing value. So, the enthalpy of the reaction uh, ends up calculating to be 164.9 kilojoules per mole. And we get that by doing the products minus reactants here. And then the entropy of the entire reaction is 172.6, however, that's in joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so note that we have kilojoules, joules, and kilojoules. We're gonna to need to adjust that in our calculation. So our Gibbs free energy of reaction, we can calculate by doing the plus 164.9 kilojoules per mole, uh, and then we're gonna subtract from that T delta S. So this is standard, so 298 Kelvin. And we need to multiply that by the entropy, but we need to adjust the unit. So it's 0.1726 in kilojoules instead of joules. So when we solve for the Gibbs free energy, that ends up coming out to be plus 113.5 kilojoules per mole. And then we need to say that that's equal to the sum of all the products minus all of the reactants. And that's where we can find that last value. I'm not gonna go ahead and do the algebra on that but it ends up coming up to be that the answer is A, negative 50.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Uh, this one's a really good question, I like this. So we have 0.06 moles of NaOH. 
dissolved in 200 grams of water, and we titrate it with 6 molar HCl. Okay? So as that reaction occurs, it's an exothermic reaction, uh, energy is transferred to the water, and it gets higher and higher in temperature until eventually it runs out of the NaOH, and the temperature stops going up. So then they repeat it, but they tweak it. So it's still 0.06 moles of NaOH, still 6 molar HCl, but now it's 400 grams of water. So this is the big difference. We started with 200 grams, now we're at 400 grams. So if we look, what we're doing is we're doubling the amount of water to absorb the energy. What we'd expect is instead of going from about 22.4 to about 26.6, we would expect to go up uh, in temperature to about half that amount. Okay. It should still take 10 milliliters because the moles of NaOH present and the, and the concentration of HCl being added are the same. But we'd expect to end up somewhere near 24 degrees Celsius by the time we get to 10 milliliters. So really, my graph is a little off here. If you want to go up a little bit more and then kind of taper off. So if we come and check our graphs, we should still start at the same point. We should end, though, somewhere around 24. So A is incorrect. If we look at B here, we start between 22 and 23, end at about 24 at 10 milliliters. So that's our choice. And then here we go, 22 to about 25, that's incorrect. And 22 to 24, but now it's at 5 milliliters, so that's incorrect. So B is our best choice there. Okay, um, here we're given a rate law. Which change will, will be the greatest impact in terms of decrease in the reaction rate? So if we decrease A by a factor of 2, that's going to decrease our rate by 4 because it's a squared effect. If we decrease B by a factor of 2, that's going to decrease our rate by 2. If we decrease both by a factor of 2, we're going to drop it by 4, and then twice as much of that, so it's going to drop by 8. And if we decrease B by a factor of 4, that's going to decrease by 4. So pretty simple, C is our best choice. Okay, activation energy, our calculation for this is natural log of K2 over K1 to negative Ea activation energy over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Okay, so when we plug this in, we're going to plug in our activation energy of 65 kilojoules per mole, and then in order for that to work, we need to make these equivalent units. So I'm going to change that to joules so that it matches my 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. I'm going to plug in my two temperatures, but those need to both be in, uh, what do you call them, Kelvins. So we're looking at 1 over 295 minus 1 over uh, 310. Okay, and if you end up with a flip sign somewhere, uh, you can just kind of factor that out when you get to the end. I never remember which one's T2 or T1. So at the end of the day, though, what you end up with is you end up with K2 over K1 is equal to 0.277 when you do all of your algebra. Okay, and then the question is, what do you do from there? So, so this is kind of a little trap here. Uh, what we're saying is, is that the initial rate constant is of course higher because it's at a higher temperature. Um, and if you multiply the second rate constant by this 0.277, you'll get the original one. So. It says what percentage is the rate constant decreased, and so therefore we need to kind of factor in the fact that the 0.277 is the ratio of the two rate constants, but it's not the percentage by which it's decreased. So the percentage by which it's decreased is it's decreasing by 72%. So this B here is a trap. It's really close to what the answer is that we got, but we need to make sure that we factor in that it's not. The ratio of the two is 0.277 to 1, but the drop then is from 1 to 0.28, which is 72% drop. Okay, and so D is the answer there, which is a shame because you could have done that entire question correctly and then gotten an answer and, and saw it, seen it in the final answers and then kind of fell apart even though you did everything else correctly. Okay, for 27, uh, we're looking at a plot of natural log uh, versus time. Um, and we're looking at reaction A turns into products. So if we get natural log of concentration of A versus time, and we end up with a linear result, the slope is negative something, um, we have confirmation that the reaction is first order in A. 
Okay. And then the slope, since it's first order, since the slope is equal to the rate constant, we know that this is also true. Uh, so both of those are true. The slope of these will always be negative k for first order or for zero order, and then the uh, slope for second order, one over concentration versus time will give you positive k. So 27, both are correct, and that would be c. Okay, and then 28 is a really tough question. So, so here's what I ended up kind of struggling with at the beginning. So you have molybdenum turning into technetium, turning into a less uh, radioactive form of technetium. So it wants to know about what's true about these, and we're kind of looking at halfway. So, so when I saw it was 6 to 65, what I said is that this is about 10 times, emitting about 10 times more radiation than this is. By some, by, you know, a little off from that. Okay. Um, so the problem is, is that as the molybdenum decomposes, it turns into this, which then becomes the more reactive form. So because it's 10 times slower, though, the assumption is going to be that you don't accumulate enough of this to really influence the answer here because of our time skips. So at that point, we're looking at um, what's going to happen as time goes by. So the first thing we notice about the answers here is that this A and B both have the activity of the technetium becoming more radioactive, which is not true. So if we're starting with equivalent amounts of those two things, this is going to be much more radioactive, and therefore A and B are incorrect. Okay. Then we're looking at the technetium becoming less active as time goes by because it's turning into this non-radioactive form, or less radioactive form. So really it's the time scale of 20 hours versus 120 hours. So what I started doing was just saying, okay, well this is 10 times more radioactive. After a half-life of this goes by, six hours goes by, then it will be five times as radioactive. That's six hours. And then if I continue on, it'll be about two and a half times as radioactive at about 12 hours. And if I continue on from there, it'll be about 1.25 times as radioactive at about 18 hours. So in C it says the activity of technetium becomes roughly equal to that of the molybdenum after 20 hours. Well, that kind of matches what I'm progressing here. I need to go down a little bit more in radioactivity, and therefore C is my answer. D says after 120 hours. After 120 hours, this would be so cut down that it's basically getting used up because its half-life is so, so high. Okay, 29, we're given a reaction mechanism, two steps, and it gives us that the second step is our rate-determining step, or our slow step which is going to therefore have the biggest influence on our kinetics. Okay, So in part A, this just gives us some statements to evaluate. It says the predominant form of iodine solution is IO minus after some time. That is possible. So we're forming the IO minus in the, in the, the, the hypoiodite in the first step, and then that's going to start to linger before it turns back into the iodide. So potentially that could be going on in the middle of the reaction, or it could not. So this is kind of in. We don't know. Okay. So in part B, it says any more iodide will not increase the rate of production of O2. Now on the one hand, there is no iodide present in the rate determining step, but on the other hand, the iodide is going to react with this very quickly and produce more hypoiodite and therefore increase that concentration. So this will increase the concentration of, of the rate determining step and therefore will increase the rate of production. So this is not correct. And then the reaction is zero order in H2O2. Since the peroxide is present in the rate determining step, we know that's incorrect. So now we've got an if answer, and now we're looking at D to see whether or not we should go back to that or go with D. So D says the reaction will go more slowly at higher oxygen pressures. Now, oxygen is present as a final product, so in theory this could go backwards, but really if we think about that, that's just going to produce more of the hypoiodite and therefore cause the reaction to go faster. So really there's not a good way for this to cause this to be the case. And at that point then I say, I know B and C are incorrect. D does not look like the correct answer to me. I go back and I pick A. So for 30 here, this one is one that I'm, I'm having a hard time with kind of coming up with a full explanation on. So we have a reaction where A and B react to form D. In, in the first step of the reaction, A and B collide and they form B into C and A stays the same. So when it says the reaction has two intermediates, we know that the only intermediate is going to be C before before the form the final product of D. So we know that two is incorrect, okay? So two can't be correct, um, both can't be correct. 
So we're down between A and B. So I ended up going with A originally because I didn't notice that it said free energy here as opposed to energy or enthalpy. So reaction displays second order kinetics. What we're seeing in that is, is that is that when I looked at this, I saw this as being the rate determining step because of this high activation energy and then low activation energy here. So step one is, is the slow, step two is the fast, and therefore this would be second order kinetics because A and B have to collide in that step. Now, I, somewhere the free energy must be changing this, but I, I, I don't understand because this step has two things colliding, this step has two things colliding, so unless there's no rate determining step or something really weird's going on, I would think that A would be correct in that we have second order kinetics. The correct answer on the, on the sheet though is D, so somehow the fact that this is free energy must be somehow changing this and I, I don't really fully understand. So if you know what's going on there, please comment in and let me know.